السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين Good evening and welcome everyone My name is Suad al a consultant clinical scientist in microbiology at Prince Sultan Military Medical City First of all, I'm very delighted and honored to have this opportunity to moderate this webinar and introducing you to our well-respected speakers. Our webinar today will be about biomarks of disease, COVID-19 vaccination and serology mark. Before we start, regarding the CME, this webinar will be accredited with three CME hours. You will be receive an email after the webinar. Please complete the questionnaire and write your Saudi Commission regist uh, registration number and the CME hours will be added automatically within two weeks in case if you don't receive uh, uh, email, if, uh, you can contact SSCC. In the beginning, I would like to share with you uh, briefly our experience with, COVID, uh, with facing COVID-19 uh, in our lab. You know, that's a good idea before we start uh, our webinar. As you may know, the microbiology, uh, I have to talk about the microbiology laboratory plays an essential role uh, when facing emerging infectious disease by offering support, diagnosis, staging, uh, uh, prognostication, therapeutic monitoring, epidemiological surveillance and also for research conducted in research area, which is in turn helps public health and hospital decision process. But we have to be very careful about some facts. However, pre-analytic and analytic and post-analytic is need to be addressed to ensure the safety and quality and timely result. So, in our lab, we faced uh, our pandemic by made some changes from baseline work as a routine in, uh, in our lab by ab uh, adopting emergency policy in order to achieve uh, the better possible outcome in terms of uh, uh, optimal and trustable uh, diagnosis result. To achieve this, we have uh, and overcome the challenges that we are facing in the beginning of pandemic and which is a new disease, we put some object or set objects or aiming to best result. First of all, we have increased the capacity of our lab by implement some tools, available tools, and to try to looking for other tools, for, especially for robot uh, an instrument and robot system to cover all the, uh, the urgent and the batches. That's what we are received in our lab. This is to assume full response in an increasing demanded scenario and maintaining regular work at reducing staff risk of infection. Second, we are stab uh, stabilized and scheduled the total number uh, of samples reaching to the lab and its processing plan. So we have to schedule and to find how we can schedule by defining, let's say, for five or five uh, batches every day, or at least more than this one, to, to schedule this uh, total number and to also to, you know, tracing and try to enter result uh, by um, good and accurate uh, uh, interpretation. We have to be very careful about this one. And also we have to uh, uh, pay full attention to time and uh, report, uh, for report results. Then after that, the last things after we are doing this and find how many batches we should be and how we can uh, maintain the um, uh, maintain the samples in the same day, calculate the turn around time for result. We have to put it in within 24 hours. This will be able to use them for clinical decision. From the whole experience, this one, we are conclude that the best things in our lab to cover this adoption of continuous sample processing method 24 7 and the implementation of high robot and drop it uh, platform systems are the best option for increasing results performance also we have to pay attention for supervision and retrain the employee for more accurate result 
by training them how they can uh, solving the troubleshooting and interpreting uh, result. This was our experience in, uh, uh, and challenge that we faced during the peak of the pandemic. So in this webinar, I'm very interested to hear about all the new updates concerning COVID-19 in terms of variants, vaccination and laboratory testing. I'm sure it will be very, very informative session and I hope you will be all enjoy. We'll be about the about the question and answer. We'll be running a live uh, question and answer at the end of the webinar. So if you have any question, just submit your question at the, uh, in the chatting box. Uh, anyway, you are not miss anything. Don't yani yeah, don't worry about it because this live session it will uh, is recorded, so you can uh, rewatch it again anytime when it's available. <coughs> Now, allow me to introduce you to the first presenter, Dr. Ammar Hamid Abbas, who will be talking about update on SARS-CoV-2 variants. Dr. Ammar Abbas is currently the consultant deputy director of preventive medicine family and committee medicine and head of patient experience department at Prince Sultan Military Medical City. He was the former director general of the Ministry of Health and consultant of preventive and community medicine Ministry of Health at Khartoum States of Sudan. He is a member of different uh, associations, including American College of Lifestyle Medicine Society, Patient and Families Rights Committee and GCI at Brit Sultan Military Medical City. Uh, could you please start? Uh, welcome, Dr. Ammar, and you can start your presentation. Dr. Ammar. Uh, thank you, Dr. Saad. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum, Allah. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam, Dr. Thank you very much. Uh, Assalamu alaikum jamian. Uh, I would like firstly to thank, uh, thank you all for this invitation to, uh, to participate in this uh, prestigious uh, meeting. And I would like to throw some lights on uh, epidemiology of COVID and uh, activities of uh, updates of mutants uh, of COVID-19. Uh, firstly, Yes, next, please. Yes. Uh, firstly, um, I would like to, to review the taxonomy of coronavirus uh, with four normal and three novel coronavirus uh, order um, nidoviral and family coronaviridae, subfamily coronavirini. Uh, there are four uh, genus of uh, coronavirus alpha, beta, gamma, and delta, delta only on pairs. Uh, this coronavirus uh, is very old since 1931, uh, when the first coronavirus discovered IBV uh, till the uh, MERS cov SARS-CoV-2 uh, in 2019. Uh, in between, uh, more than 15 types of uh, coronavirus emergence of SARS-CoV, um, SARS in 2012, uh, MERS CoV, and different other um, types of coronaviruses spreading all over the globe. Next, please. Next, please. Next, please. Yes, uh, as I said, since 1931, uh, discovered uh, till the discovery of uh, coronavirus pandemic disease in Wuhan 19, uh, 2019. This is zoonotic diseases. Actually, it is not a, a live virus. As I know, it is not alive. Uh, it is just moving and replicating when entering the uh, cell, human cell. Uh, very unusual, this virus, uh, positive, single-stranded, genome, uh, 
which have uh, more than almost 30,000 nucleotides, uh, which makes the separation and activities of variants, which we will uh, discuss uh, that during the rest of this presentation. The transmission is known through droplet infection, uh, aerosol, through brief speak, cough, sneeze. Uh, we need viral uh, particle density in please uh, 50 particle speaking, 200 particles. Coughing and sneezing will produce more than 1,000, uh, 3,000 viral particles. The amount of uh, viral load that or density that needs to be uh, infected to uh, to provoke uh, transmission is only 1,000 viral particle. Uh, the types of uh, transmission and types of, uh, uh, of uh, there are four types of transmission, either community broad transmission or in cluster geographical or some areas, some uh, sporadic or maybe zero hope we in case on the world of the world we will reach the zero uh, soon. Uh, regarding uh, uh, R0 or R0, uh, this is uh, the uh, number of uh, infected uh, patients that could be uh, transmitted from one patient at one power point and double in time. This is the time the virus needs to be doubled in uh, number of cases. Uh, we will discuss the types of variants, variants of uh, uh, interest, variants of uh, concern, and variants of high concern. Uh, regarding, uh, as we will talk about the variants in uh, coronavirus, we need to review some of the uh, most uh, uh, the, the, the coronavirus structure. As we said, this is the largest uh, uh, Mesinger RNA genome with positive stranded RNA having a bilayer lipid uh, layer and spikes, uh, spikes protein, which is very important in mutation. We will discuss, inshallah. Um, there is a S spikes protein, M membranes protein, and nucleocapsid protein, uh, in addition to hemagglutinin, uh, esterase, glycoprotein, and uh, envelope protein. These are types of protein which usually be exposed to, uh, to mutation. Uh, as we have mentioned, we have started with SARS uh, 2002. To 2003, MERS-CoV, uh, which has a case fatality of 35%, uh, and now with COVID-19, uh, with case fatality rate ranging between one to five. Uh, regarding the statistics uh, globally, uh, now we have exceeded the 4.1 uh, million cases uh, globally worldwide, with 98% uh, recovery rate and 2% case fatality rate. Uh, now, this is the third peak, third peak of uh, coronavirus uh, worldwide, and now dropping uh, from uh, 700,000 to 500,000 for the last three weeks. Also, deaths are dropping during the last uh, seven or eight weeks. Uh, regarding KSA, Kingdom Saudi Arabia, uh, now uh, we have 5,043,000 uh, uh, with case fatality rate of 2% and uh, recovery rate with 98%. Uh, vaccination uh, in Saudi Arabia now exceeded uh, uh, 40 million doses with uh, 16, uh, 16 million fully vaccinated for the, with the second dose and 22 million uh, with first dose administered. Uh, regarding the cases and deaths uh, compared with age and sex reported according to WHO, it's very obvious that this age 30 to 39, this is the most uh, prevalent age for the uh, prevalence of uh, an incidence of COVID. Uh, 19 regarding the deaths, mostly among the above sixties, uh, the the spread of the infection, the incidence and prevalence is least among the less than five, uh, both in case uh, incidences, prevalence rate, and deaths. Uh, regarding the mortality rate by age, as we have mentioned, uh, mortality above uh, above sixty or above eighty is more 
and least with less than five, as we have mentioned in the last slide. This is the case fatality rate, with, which is calculated from the closed cases, both active and, and, and expired cases. Uh, Saudi in Saudi Arabia, now the case fatality rate uh, is uh, 1.29 uh, in comparing with uh, different countries in Eastern Mediterranean region, uh, for example, in uh, Egypt, 5.8, in uh, United uh, States, uh, sorry, United States, 1.7, in Kuwait, uh, 0 0.5, and other countries. Yes. Uh, regarding the activities of variance, according to WHO classification, uh, there are uh, different three types of uh, variants, variants of concern, variants of interest, and variants of high concern. The most important is various of concern, among which the Delta one, is the most uh, prevalent one worldwide, uh, P1, B.1.617.2. Uh, this is, uh, it was prevalent in India, uh, and now uh, spread it all over the world, more than 181 uh, country, 181 country worldwide, uh, Alpha, Beta, Gamma, Alpha, Beta, Gamma, and Delta, according to WHO, there are various uh, of uh, various of interest with different uh, other uh, that have some interest in increasing, uh, decreasing the efficiency of vaccine, decreasing the, the response to antibodies or response to vaccine, uh, reducing the antibodies formulation uh, with different types, which uh, more than Billions of mutations occur uh, on daily basis in different human cells, uh, but uh, some of concern or concern variants were mentioned in these pages. Uh, regarding the alpha one, uh, this is P117. Uh, this is variant, one of the variants of concern, which has been uh, called alpha by the world uh, WHO. Um, having 30 to 60, 30 to 70 percent more infectious and 55 percent more deadly than other variants. This is a plan, this is a map of spread of this virus, uh, mostly in Brazil, Canada, uh, China, Britain, South Africa, and some other countries. The beta one, uh, this is uh, 1.351 line age and uh, this is uh, called by WHO beta, uh, uh, also having been affected by uh, the, the efficiency against uh, vaccination and efficiency of treatment of COVID uh, and spread in different countries, as we have mentioned in Canada, USA, South Africa, Britain, China, Australia, and others. The third one is gamma, uh, this variant uh, known as P1. Uh, firstly discovered in Japan and now most prevalent in Brazil and South, uh, South Africa, South America, sorry, uh, in Mexico, in the States, uh, in uh, India, in Sweden and other uh, areas of the world. Regarding the fourth and the most, most important one is the Delta and Kappa B1617. This is uh, evade some types of antibodies, uh, <coughs> prime antibodies uh, formulation. Um, it's widespread in California and outpacing the other variant of concern. Uh, more than 80% of the variance is of uh, this Delta type. Uh, these four, Alpha 193 country, Beta in 141 country, Gamma in 91 country, and Delta in 170 country. Um, in the GCC area or EMRU area, uh, more than 15 countries of the 22 countries of the EMRU is affected by this uh, Delta uh, variant. Effectiveness, there are several false selection in utilization of antibody uh, in treatment. Uh, we will uh, discuss the uh, effect on different vaccines in the next slide. Um, according to study uh, in May 2021, uh, the efficacy of the vaccine Again, is these variants, Pfizer uh, registered 88% effectiveness after the second dose against uh, beta variant uh, in India and 93% effective against the variant found in UK. 
regarding AstraZeneca vaccine were 60% effective against uh, PETA and 66 effective against uh, PETA 1171 and the first against two. Uh, the first dose, regarding the first dose, only effective by 33% against PETA 2 and 50% uh, effective against PETA 1. Uh, the last one uh, mentioned Mu virus, uh, which is reported uh, in South America and now spread it uh, all over Europe. Uh, this is actually a variant of interest as registered uh, from uh, re registered uh, uh, by WHO uh, eight months ago. It is not new. It is just a variant of, con con uh, variant of interest, not concern. Uh, this summarizes uh, SARS-CoV-2 variants of uh, concern and vaccines. Uh, as uh, obvious, you could see uh, Pfizer uh, is very effective, more than uh, almost 90% against uh, beta-1 uh, and 70% uh, against uh, uh, beta-1351. Uh, AstraZeneca, 75% uh, effective against uh, beta-117, and Johnson & Johnson also effective against Brazilian one, gamma, and so on, so it should be very beneficial for the people. Regarding the phases, there are post-viral response phase, uh, started according to time course, mm -hmm. in the viremic phase, and the pulmonary phase starting mm -hmm. uh, after the host viral response, uh, the, the most inflammatory uh, response will start in pulmonary phase, uh, TCV phase. Uh, the viral phase, viremic phase, is responsive to antivirals, uh, which reduce these symptoms and uh, contagiousness of the virus. Uh, antivirals in pulmonary phase uh, use less corticosteroids and anticoagulatives and convalescence plasma. Uh, the severe cases, uh, Use corticosteroids and population uh, interleukin K6 inhabitants uh, on anti inflammatory uh, drugs. This is general outline of management it's different, in different phases uh, of the viremic phase, uh, moderate phase, and severe phase. Uh, thank you uh, very much for uh, being given this opportunity. And be ready to receive any questions <coughs> regarding this brief presentation. Thank you, Dr. Ammar, for your uh, informative presentation. Uh, allow me now to present the second uh, uh, the second presentation, which is about COVID-19 vaccine and effect on emerging variant, presented by Dr. Maram Al Nayan. Uh, Dr. Maram Al Benayan is currently is allergy and immunology specialist at King Faisal Specialist Hospital, Riyadh, uh, uh, Riyadh, and she is currently in her uh, second year of fellowship in no, adult no. allergy and immunology. No, no, I finished. I'm a consultant of allergy immunology in Prince Sultan Medical Center. Okay, she sorry. Uh, she obtained her M, uh, FC, uh, MBBS degree in College of Medicine and Internship at King Saud University, uh, and she achieved her USMLE uh, preparation Kaplan Medical, Washington, USA. Thank you, Dr. Mal. Can you please start your presentation, that kindly? Thank you. It's a privilege to be today. Um, I will start the presentation with a small introduction. So this is the table of content of what we will talk about. An introduction, a comparison, variants, special population, drug modifications, rate through infections, immunity. So excuse me, excuse me, doctor. Uh, please uh, mute the microphone, please. Excuse me. Yes, you can start, Dr. Mara. Yes. Um, at the end of 2019, a novel coronavirus known as Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome Coronavirus 2 
was identified as the cause of a cluster of pneumonia cases in Wuhan. It ra rapidly spread, resulting in a global pandemic as we know. Vaccines to prevent the SARS infection are considered the most promising approach for curbing the pandemic and are being vigorously pursued. By the end of 2020, several vaccines had become available for use in different parts of the world. As you can see in this uh, slide, vaccines, uh, vaccine ha vaccines have been around for multiple, multiple centuries. The first vaccine uh, in 1796 was for the smallpox. Uh, as with um, some of the infections that were, all, uh, were eradicated, uh, such as measles, came back after people had hesitancy with the vaccine. So uh, it's very important that we fight the hesitancy of uh, vaccination with the population. So with that, we'll move on to what the vaccines that are available in the United States and the Middle East. Uh, I'll talk about the most common vaccines we're using. So we'll start off with the Pfizer vaccine, which is given 0.3 ml, uh, 21 days apart. The efficacy was with the wild type uh, was found to be at a rate of 95%. Uh, common side effects with this vaccine were uh, fatigue, headache, myalgias, epilateral uh, lymphadenopathy, fever, chills, and joint pain. Um, anaphylaxis was reported, was found to be, uh, to be at a rate of five per million with uh, the Pfizer vaccine. But after the first 10 million doses of Pfizer vaccine given, 50 episodes were reported in the United States through the CDC, which reflects a lower risk that had been initially uh, stated. Anaphylaxis occurred 90% within the first 30 minutes. Uh, some uh, some of the uh, there's a study done in uh, Massachusetts Mass General, multi center study showed that uh, people at receiving the second dose of vaccine after uh, having allergic reaction to the first dose of vaccine had uh, no reaction with the second dose. The study had 189 patients, but only 17% of those patients reported uh, a category of anaphylaxis uh, reaction. There is a, a, a rare side effect, but important one, which is myocarditis, myocarditis, seen in both Moderna and Pfizer vaccine. Uh, 216 reported cases of myocarditis, pericarditis, following one dose of the mRNA vaccine, and 573 cases following the two doses of, uh, of, of the vaccine. Three-fourths of the patients were male. The median age was 30 years old with the first dose, and uh, uh, with the second dose, the median age was 24. The estimated rate of myocarditis, pericarditis among individuals 16 to 39 years of age uh, following the second dose was 16.1 cases per million. Among the cases that have been reported, most were mild. Onset uh, was generally within the first week after vaccine more commonly after the second dose. There was only one report of a, fa a fatality due to myocarditis uh, that was reported in New Zealand. Others were mild and uh, responded well to medical treatment and rapid improvement in symptoms. Could, could you all mute the mic so I can, uh, there's an echo. Yeah, please mute it. With the Moderna vaccine, the dose uh, is 0.5 ml, given one uh, to uh, 28 days apart. The efficacy was uh, found with the wild type was 86.4%. Uh, the, the side effects um, after among nearly 2 million vaccine recipients in the United States, uh, post the vaccine uh, surveys showed that mostly were injection site reactions with swelling, pleuritis, fatigue, headache, and myalgias. After the second dose, uh, fever, chills, and joint pain reported as well. Reactions were most uh, frequently reported on the day following vaccinations. Anaphylaxis uh, was reported as well with this um, uh, vaccine uh, at a rate of 2.8 events per 1 million doses. But after 7.5 uh, million doses of mRNA given in the United States, only 21 cases of anaphylaxis were reported. 90% uh, occurred within 30 minutes. Um, there, it's important to note that there, there is a prospective study going on in the NIH. They're recruiting 100 patients that had a allergic reaction to the first dose uh, and uh, will be given the second dose uh, in the hospital to see what type of reaction could develop. Uh, this study would be, will become a prospective study. 
another rare case of Bell's palsy were considered potentially related to this vaccine, although the rate did not exceed the background rate in the general population. Uh, myocarditis, pericarditis were also reported with the Moderna vaccine. Moving on to the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, um, the, uh, which is also called the AD26.COV2.S. Uh, the efficacy was re uh, reported to be at 66.9%. Uh, the symptoms were, um, th this vaccine is a replication incompetent adenovirus 26 vector that expresses a stabilized uh, spike protein. Uh, the, adenovirus 20, the adenovirus 26 vectors are used in Ebola vaccine that is licensed in, the, in Europe for RSV, HIV, and Zika vaccine candidates, so it's not a new vaccine. In a phase three efficacy trial, uh, it show, um, the reported overall efficacy varied by region. Um, we, will, we will talk about the regions uh, when we talk about the variants. So moving on to the side effects, uh, most were mild fatigue, pain, and headache. Um, uh, the phase three trials showed serious uh, adverse events in the vaccine and placebo groups were similar, although there were some more cases of thromboembolic uh, uh, events in the, in, the, in, in, in the vaccine group, 11 versus 3 in the placebo, tinnitus, 6 versus 0 in the placebo, and seizures, 4 versus 1 among vaccine compared with placebo recipients. Uh, but the case, the events were too few to determine whether there is a causal association with the vaccine. After 200,000 uh, healthcare workers were vac vaccinated in South Africa, only five arterial th uh, thromboembolic events were reported. That's 1.7 per 100,000 reported after vaccine. There is a very specific syndrome uh, for both the Johnson Johnson and AstraZeneca, which is the thrombosis with thrombocytopenia, also called uh, vaccine-associated immune thrombotic thrombocytopenia events that occurred with uh, these vaccines. Uh, many of the cases have been associated with autoantibodies directed against the platelet factor 4, PF4 antigen. So uh, in May, 2000, uh, May 7, 2021, after administration of 8.7 million doses uh, of the Johnson Johnson in the United States, only 28 cases of thrombosis with thrombocytopenia syndrome have been reported. Uh, 25 of these cases occurred in unusual sites, 19 with cerebral venous uh, sinus thrombosis with or without thrombosis at other sites, including, including mesentric vessels. Three cases were fatal. Um, 22 cases occurred in females, and the median age was 40 years old. Uh, the risk was assessed uh, as 12.5 per million for females 30 to 39 years old, and 9.4 million for females 40 to 49 years old. The male uh, age group and uh, general population were 1.3 to 4.7 per, per, per million. So initial symptoms include headache, chills, fevers, nausea, vomiting, abdominal pain, malaise, and then they progress to severe headache, severe abdominal pain, and focal neurological symptoms. Um, at, at only two patients out of uh, all the 28 had a negative uh, ELISA for um, anti-PF4. The majority had positive anti-PF4 in the, in the blood. So when, when, what we should be aware of is the possible association and uh, uh, of, the, uh, of this syndrome after vaccine. So any patient that has a symptom suggestive of thrombocytopenia with new petechia, bruising, uh, thrombotic complications, shortness of breath, uh, chest pain, lower extremity edema, focal neurological symptoms, severe headache, severe backache, should be suspected. Uh, diagnosis is based after the, the after receiving the vaccine four to thirty days after vaccine with a platelet count of less than one hundred and fifty, elevated D dimer and positive HIT study, which is the anti PF four antibody. Treatment with would be with a non heparin, non warfarin anticoagulant such as uh, argatroban or direct oral anticoagulant. An IVIG has been suggested to be used. The CDC recommends not using heparin in individuals with thrombosis following this vaccine, unless the HIT testing is negative. Moving on to the AstraZeneca vaccine, also known as the chad ox one ncov 19 vaccine. It is given at 0.5 ml, 8 to 12 weeks apart. The efficacy ranges between 62 to 90%. Um, in a subsequent analysis of a trial vaccine efficacy for symptomatic COVID-19 was 76% from 21 days or 90 days 
uh, whichever came first, uh, suggesting that this, there's a protection with a single dose. Additionally, rec recipients of the second dose at 12 weeks or later um, were associated with higher vaccine efficacy than people that received the dose at less than six, uh, six weeks, uh, 81 versus 55%. These findings led to the support to extend the time interval for the second dose to 12 uh, weeks. So, um, and uh, side effects with this medication had uh, mild fatigue, pain, and headache. Thrombosis was also reported uh, 2.8 per, um, uh, 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 thrombosis uh, was also reported with these patients. Um, transverse myelitis was reported in two, in two cases. Uh, one was was thought to be possibly related to the vaccine and was described as an idiopathic short segment spinal cord demyelination. The other was in a participant with previously unrecognized multiple sclerosis and thought to be unrelated to the vaccine. Uh, um, thrombocytopenia thromb with thrombocytosis was uh, also found with uh, AstraZeneca, as mentioned before. Moving on to the Sinopharm, these are inactivated whole virus vaccine um, based on two SARS-CoV isolates from patients in China, uh, the WIV04 and the HbO2. The efficacy was 73% with the WIV04 and HbO2 for, as it was 78% with the wild type. The side effects were um, headache, pain, and fatigue. This, uh, this uh, was uh, given in uh, Bahrain, authorized in Bahrain. Uh, um, Biotech Covaxin um, was uh, is uh, being used in India, as uh, well as uh, some uh, countries uh, such as the UAE. Um, this is given at with 0.5 ml, 29 days apart. The efficacy was reported at 81%. This was a press release. Uh, further uh, critical review has to be done to just test for this efficacy, though. So with um, neutral, neutralizing antibodies are what we we what predicts vaccine effectiveness. It, it was measured within the first few months. So now moving on to the variants uh, and the vaccines. So uh, in a recent study that published in the New England Journal of Medicine uh, showed that Pfizer vaccine had 93.7% effectiveness against the alpha vaccine and 88% against the delta vaccine. Uh, was found to have 75% uh, against the beta. With Moderna, the, vac uh, the vaccine, they reported effect effectiveness against the variants, but no, no um, uh, percentages. Johnson Johnson had effectiveness, efficacy against the 74% uh, against the alpha, 50%, 52% against the beta, and 66% uh, against the gamma. AstraZeneca uh, showed uh, uh, the same study in New England Journal of Medicine showed that effectiveness, effectiveness against the alpha was 74.5% and uh, against the beta 60% and delta 67%. Sinopharm um, uh, reported effectiveness against the, uh, the variants but did not report uh, um, uh, as percentages as well as the uh, Covaxin. It is no it's important to note here that uh, regarding the Delta vaccine, um, the patient, the, the vac there is a study done against patients that were vaccinated and unvaccinated patients and uh, their response to uh, Delta vaccine. So uh, among the vaccinated, while infections are reduced for vaccine, we are seeing breakthrough infections that are milder, less symptomatic and shorter duration of il um, illness. The duration of viral shedding and symptoms are milder and shorter with vaccinated people. Vaccine re remains incredibly effective at reducing the risk of hospitalization and death. Vaccinated infected patients likely can transmit the infection, but are likely to infect fewer people and um, be infectious for a shorter period of time. With patients that are unvaccinated, there is a lot more virus detected in the patient's nose, a thousand fold higher. This is important and is likely partly explains the fact that the virus is more transmissible. Uh, more people are infected by each infected person. Prior variants infected about 2.5 people. Delta infects five people. An unvaccinated can transmit infection even to fully vaccinated patient people. So that's why it's important to tell our patients and uh, for ourselves to know that the, the, the vaccine works against the variants and that it is important to be vaccinated. 
So we'll move on to the special population of, of patients, the immunocompromised individuals with immunocompromising conditions. This is important because there's uh, um, uh, the CDC approved a third vac vaccination with the mRNA vaccines, Pfizer and uh, Moderna, for uh, these spe special populations. So anybody on chemotherapy uh, for cancer, hematological malignancies, hematopoietic stem cell transplant or solid organ transplant patients, in untreated HIV infection with CD4 cell count less than 200 cells per microliter, immune deficiency disorders, immunosuppressive medications. So the drug modifications with the vaccine. With oral medications, uh, um, important to note the IVIG, the steroid patients with uh, mycophenolate, immurans, oral cyclophosphamide, there are no modifications with therapy. With the methotrexate and Janus, uh, the JAK uh, inhibitors, we suggest uh, holding uh, these medications one week, uh, holding one week after each vaccine dose. With subcutaneous abatisap, we hold that one week prior to and one week after the first vaccine dose, but not interrupting it with the second vaccine dose. With IV abatisap, timing the vaccine administration so that the first vaccine will occur four weeks after abatisap infusion, infusion and post, postponing the subsequent abatisept infusion by one week. So there's a five week interrupted uh, interruption between the, uh, the doses. IV cyclophosphamide, administ we administer it, uh, uh, it will occur approximately one week after each vaccine dose when feasible. Rituximab, we initiate the vaccine series approximately four weeks prior to the next scheduled rituximab cycle. We also su suggest delaying rituximab two to four weeks after the second vaccine dose. So, and then uh, we'll talk now about the breakthrough infections. Um, uh, in the United States, as of April 30th, 2021, 10,262 breakthrough infections had been reported. After 101 million fully vaccinated individu individuals, um, of those with the breakthrough infections, only 10% were hospitalized and 2% died. Although not all hospitalizations or death were related to COVID-19. 27% of infections were asymptomatic. So we'll talk about immunity now from infection versus vaccine. So a recent NIH founded study showed that antibodies generated following vaccination are more focused on the receptor binding domain, the RBD of the spike protein compared to the autoantibodies generated after acquired infection. This suggests that vaccine generated immunity may be more likely to target new SARS-CoV-2 variants potentially even when the variant contains new mutations in their RBD. Um, after vaccination, one uh, paper reported 82% of 68 individuals recovered from COVID-19 showed continued antibodies, uh, titers, and B-cell memory cells six to 12 months after infection. In the particip participants who were vaccinated after the infection, 41%, the IgG responses increased 30-folds, neutralizing activity by 50-folds, and circulating number of memory B-cells by 9-folds. So uh, the key takeaway points were that in individuals who have immunocompromising conditions are, or are taking immunosuppressive agents should undergo COVID-19 vaccine. Immunogenicity of the COVID-19 vaccine appears lower in such individuals compared with the general population and vaccine efficacy is uncertain. Nevertheless, the potential for severe COVID-19 in this population likely outweighs the risk uncertainties and that a third vaccine should be given uh, to, to this special population. Also to note, uh, because some people are hesitant with the anaphylaxis, and I see a lot of people that come to me in the clinic asking about anaphylactic reactions to the vaccine, it's important to note that inactivated flu vaccine uh, has 1.4 per million um, anaphylactic reactions. Neococcal polysaccharide vaccine has 2.5 million. Live attenuated herpes zoyster vaccine, which is given to the elderly, is given 9.6 per million. And the Pfizer vaccine, Moderna, are, as we stated, are 5 per million and 2.8 per million. So uh, I advocate to give the vaccine to all, pay, uh, all people that can uh, receive the vaccine. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Maram. It's very informative and nice, clear uh, presentation. Now we transfer to the third presentation in this webinar. It will be going about laboratory testing, the role of PCR and serology testing. Uh, Dr. Sana Sheikh uh, is presented by Dr. Sana Sheikh. Dr. Sana Sheikh is consultant uh, molecular virologist with PhD uh, from uh, PhD from University of Manchester 
is uh, in diagnostic molecular virology, virology. She is now a head of virology and serology laboratory in, at the MAM MCH. She is member of the scientific uh, board of laboratory science at Saudi, Saudi Commission for Health Specialists. She is also member of the consultant committee of virology at molecular laboratory at uh, King Saudi Arabia working. Uh, the, thank you, Dr. Sana, for coming. And please, could you start your presentation? Thank you so much. Uh, good evening. Can you hear me? Yes, Doctor. Hello? Yeah, OK. Yes, we can. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much for this uh, introduction. And uh, I would like to thank the organizing committee for giving me the chance to participate in this uh, activity. Uh, today, I'll present uh, about the laboratory testing for COVID-19, the rule of PCR and serology. Uh, I will give a brief introduction. Statistic almost covered. Uh, then I will go directly to the diagnostic test available with molecular diagnostic techniques and finally the conclusion. Uh, I'm, I'm sure, I'm quite sure that everybody knows now about this virus, its name, the syndrome it causes, where and when it started in Wuhan in 2019, December, and that affects almost all countries in the world, causing the first almost pandemic, uh, affecting millions of people since 19, nine, since 1919, before about 100, 100 years when Spanish flu infected more than around 50 million people. And now we have uh, almost more, 226 millions up until now affected with this coronavirus. Uh, however, uh, this is the um, uh, latest statistics as effect, as I mentioned, uh, more than 200 million was case, fatality, with, uh, case fatality rates is two. However, in Saudi Arabia, it's a, um, a low number because of the strict and good um, strict um, control measurement taken here in Saudi Arabia by the government of, uh, by the government and the Ministry of Health. I could, the reasons for the rapid spread include uh, high transmissibility of the virus, especially among asymptomatic or minimally symptomatic carriers. Also, the appearance, uh, the apparent absence of any cross react of protective immunity from any related viral infection, and the delayed public health response measure, the delayed public health response measure, because this nobody was expecting this virus to spread so fast within a few months from the China to all over the world. And nobody was expecting that it has also a high rate of mutation. Although it's an RNA virus, most RNA virus have a high rate of mutation, but not as this COVID-19, which as mentioned in the previous lectures, mutated a lot. Uh, anyhow, and internationally, there is a decline in the cases now because of the uh, measures taken, because of the vaccination. But as we can see in Saudi Arabia, in Saudi Arabia, it's notable. The decline is notable in cases in Saudi Arabia. It's mainly, as mentioned earlier, due to the right and excellent strict measures taken by the government, the Ministry of Health to contain this virus and the people following these strict measures. Okay, the key factors for epidemic or pandemic containment, especially in the absence of effective treatment and before in the absence of any vaccination, usually depends on many factors, is um, identification of the cases and uh, viral detection um, and result reporting. This is in the lab. Isolation of infectious cases, qu early quarantine up for suspected cases and close contact, and changes in in individual behaviors such as very uh, social distancing, use of face mask, hand hygiene, and public health measures, travel restriction, bans on mass gathering, and lockdown in case of these measures um, uh, were in, 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 ineffective in halting the spread of the virus. And out of all these, as we can see, the viral detection and result reporting, so lab virus, SARS coronavirus detection, is the most crucial and important in the management of patients and, and the implementation of disease control strategies to contain the coronavirus at a clinical and population level. As a proper, fast, accurate result, identification can uh, cause early uh, identification of cases and therefore early isolation 
the infectious cases and the quarantine of suspected cases and close contacts, all these will interrupt the transmission and cause decrease in the number of susceptible persons, decrease basic reproductive number of cases, and it will help a lot. So the, the lab diagnosis is very important in uh, containment of the epidemic and pandemic. So we'll go now to the diagnosis. The diagnosis of COVID-19 should be based on clinical data, epidemiological history, and tests for etiologic agent, which is very important. Okay, the most important diagnostic method. Uh, and test to support the diagnosis of, uh, I mean, test to support the diagnosis of the disease. This is ancillary test or supportive test for the disease and its complications. The role of diagnostic testing is dependent, is dependent on many factors affect the diagnosis, the lab diagnosis, and the test for etiological agents. The stage of the infection, when is the stage of the infection, when the sample is collected, type of the diagnostic test available, as mentioned, serological antibody, uh, antigen, uh, genetic material, uh, type and time of the material or specimen used, either serum, urine, uh, pieces, anything, and the resources required and available inside each lab for the diagnosis and time to obtain the results. Uh, faster result is better, um, uh, better diagnosis. Okay, the diagnostic test can be uh, can be um, categorized into two non-specific test and specific test. If we talk about non-specific test, we mean the clinical, either clinically or laboratory. Clinically, uh, these all non-specific tests are supportive ancillary tests, uh, like detection of the sign and symptom of the disease, fever, uh, say fever, uh, sore throat, cough, uh, or a radio radiographic test, just X-ray for the test, vital signs, and bio biomarkers in the in the blood, like interleukins, leukopenia, pneumo uh, leukopenia, uh, and uh, leukocytosis or lymphopenia. All these consider as a, su a supportive test, and they share uh, these test results share almost share. Um, the same, the results are almost similar in many respiratory uh, infections. So they are not specific for the corona. They can be found, the same result can be found in many uh, infection, many respiratory infection. So they are not used for the definitive diagnosis. They don't exclude a co-infection or alternative diagnosis. They all, they are, they are helping, but they don't exclude the infection or alternate or an alternative diagnosis. We go now to the specific test. Specific test, which when I talk about specifics, I mean these diag used in the diagnostic laboratory for the diagnosis because some other specific tests, but they are not um, used in the diagnostic laboratory which will be mentioned later. If we talk about the diagnostic test, and uh, also they can be defined, they can be uh, categorized into either detecting the viral particles or detecting the immune response of the body against the virus. Okay, uh, detect immune response, um, immune response of the body against the virus. This is when we detect the antibodies, the immunoglobulins targeting the virus released by the body and targeting the virus. These are like IgG and IgM can be detected by ELISA, by Camellia Menses immunoassay, which is more accurate, and immunochromatography, which is point of care testing. These uh, detection of the viral particles also can be either detecting the genetic materials, RNA of the virus or by the viral proteins, antigens. Uh, this can be done by genetic material test Test um, detection can be done by BCR, but it's called RT-BCR because it's an RNA. And uh, different targets are now used. Uh, different platforms are available. For the viral antigens, it also can be detected by other point of care, CLIA, similar to the antibodies, and also by ELISA. Both the viral antigen test and antibody test considered serological tests as the test depends on the antigen antibody reaction. However, for these, this one detects the antibody and it doesn't target the virus, target the immune response, and this viral antigen target the virus. Both of them are the serological tests. There are some other tests, as I mentioned, but they are not used in the diagnostic laboratory, mainly used in research laboratories. 
when visualizing for using electron microscope for visual, visualizing the viral particles, the virus itself, and light microscope for identifying the intracellular viral inclusions and viral culture to study in vitro virus replication and to um, study its infectivity and know about the viral pathogenesis. Uh, sequencing also to detect sequencing was very is, is targeting the virus like the viral culture but sequencing usually it's um it's it needs high expertise and it uses research laboratories mainly to the, or um reference laboratories uh, to detect the different variants and the mutations in the virus before we uh, discuss about each uh, of these diagnostics that mentioned earlier, it's very important to know the time when each marker for uh, the COVID for the SARS coronavirus to appear, uh, appear and the time, the timeline for each one. Okay, first, once you uh, acquired the um, virus till you have the symptoms, this is considered an, an incubation, an incubation period, period, which range from two days to almost to 14 days. The incubation period is from acquiring the infection to the first appearance of COVID-19 symptoms. It's var it varies from person to person with the range that is characteristic of the disease. It might be shorter, it might be uh, a bit longer, but it, it's within these 14 days. In this incubation period, usually the virus will be detectable from maybe the second day. The virus will be detectable both the antigen and the RNA can be detected uh, from that person. But the antibodies not yet uh, rise. Our the latent period, which is a very critical period, is when the uh, patient acquired the infection to the onset of infectiousness. The patient become uh, infected, uh, um, infectious to other people. This is very critical uh, period because once the patient become infectious and without any symptoms, um, the patient might um, increase uh, the spread of the infection to others without noticing that. So it's very critical and it varies from person to person. And then the infectious period is when the patient become infectious and can infect other person uh, uh, till the resolving of the infectiousness of the person, resolving of symptoms or the infectiousness. The lens of the, and the relationship between these three periods usually um, influence how infections spread uh, in the population. So if you go now to antibody testing, we see that anti many platforms are used for antibody testing. As I mentioned, CLIA, ELISA, and um, uh, immunochromatography point of care. Although the antibody testing is very helpful to determine how many people were previously infected, it might help in doing that also. And for contact tracing, also for herd immunity assessment, also for vaccine efficacy evaluation, as mentioned in the uh, just uh, the previous lecture. Also, it helps as a source of compulsant plasma treatment if proven good for treatment. Uh, although it's it's very important uh, and it play a role in in yeah, it has a role in all these things. But however, the sensitivity and specificity of surgical tests also um, uh, it's, it's a factor. It's a factor as no up until now no gold standard. Uh, antibody test is available or developed and uh, many factors as mentioned as not all patients who have SARS coronavirus infection will have detectable level of antibodies by particularly if they have milder if they have milder symptoms some people they don't have they still they have the corona but and they resolve the corona but still the antibody they are not detectable in their blood okay and um, uh, the absence of antibody uh, don't imply the absence of protection against the virus. It doesn't mean that if you don't have an antibody, it doesn't mean that you are susceptible to the infection if you are previously infected. Because of the cellular immunity, we know that uh, there might be an efficient uh, specific cellular immune response that give you a protection against reinfection. Um, another thing, so uh, the presence of antibodies, uh, don't throw out the possibility that the individual is still infectious. If you have uh, if you have the antibody, okay, it doesn't mean that you are not infectious or you are infectious, okay? So, uh, 
as we as we mentioned as as uh, I told you that's why so uh, antibody tests cannot be used in in diagnostic test for detecting that this patient is um, corona or not or have previous corona or not because of the sensitivity specific because of this factor and the most important also that it, it cannot be used for um, uh, for diagnosis that the delay in rising uh, on rising the antibody and become detectable okay these are most of the platforms are developed now and these are most of the companies develop the um, antibody testing okay so uh, it can't be used for the diagnosis it's mainly used for epidemiological studies surveillance therapy approach and vaccine assessment now we go to the viral antigen uh, testing for the viral proteins these uh, many companies developed uh, kits for detecting the viral proteins and um, uh, now, this one, point of care, immunochromatography, are, is available now in Saudi Arabia in, prim in a primary health care. So it's point of care uh, test where the antibody or antigen can be detected. Is the different kits target different uh, genes, either the spike, spike protein or nucleic acid capsid protein based on the kit used in the company. However, positive result considered positive. Even at this point of care and primary health care, any positive result, they consider it as positive and reported to the Ministry of Health. However, symptomatic patient with negative antigen test uh, must collect another sample for PCR testing. So a negative result doesn't rule out the possibility of having um, coronavirus, uh, COVID-19. So all patients, symptomatic patients, they must undergo another test by PCR. They must collect another sample. Uh, so useful for rapid diagnosis. This is useful for rapid diagnosis, as I mentioned, the primary health care and in-house testing, self-in-house testing, uh, as now in UK, it's available in UK. It's available also in Bahrain now. So over the counter in, in all form in most pharmacies. So anybody want to assist himself, he can take it uh, from the pharmacy. Anyhow, to control the disease and to know the cases, anybody take uh, by the test, he has to give his um, ID, national ID number and all information. But again, they cannot know about the, uh, the result, if it's positive or not. This is self-responsibility. This is uh, person uh, by person himself. Anyhow, here that's why here because Saudi Arabia is giving is ha, is putting a strict uh, measurement for containing the disease. This only available in a primary healthcare. It's not available in pharmacies. Uh, now we go to uh, the uh, gold standard molecular test. Molecular test is the gold standard. Uh, for testing for coronavirus, because of that, the gold standard test for coronavirus. Uh, and the result of it is definitive in case of the detection, although it might not reflect the status of the disease, uh, which will be discussed later because it might be remnant or whatever, but it is the gold standard for, the, for detecting the uh, genetic material of the virus. Now we go to the sample collection. The best sample for molecular test, which is the gold standard, the best test is a respiratory tract sample. However, I, I have to mention also that for antigen testing, also it is a respiratory sample. It's a respiratory uh, sample. It's just a swab taken from the throat because it's it can be used in-house self-testing. Uh, the best sample for blocker testing, again, is upper, uh, upper respiratory tract sample, nasopharyngeal. Nasopharyngeal is the best sample and must be collected properly. And oropharyngeal swab uh, can be used. However, if oropharyngeal swab used, better combined with nasopharyngeal swab in the same tube and avoid using the cotton, the swab with cotton tip and wooden shaft as this might inhibit the PCR and give you, giving um, false negative results for not only for this virus, for any virus, BCR, any molecular test will be inhibited by cotton and wooden and wooden traces. So please, so use a Dacron swab and place it in a BTM to preserve viral transport media to preserve the genetic material of the virus and transport it to the lab immediately. 
if the patients have a productive cough, then it's good to uh, provide a sputum sample. However, even if you provide a sputum sample, it is better to provide with it an esopharyngeal and don't depend on the sputum sample alone. As from our experience in the lab, most of the sputum samples might give a muc mucoid and the mucus sometimes give a false negative or it has some inhibitors. Not all, but some. So it's better to include um, an esopharyngeal swab with it. If the patient is intubated, then uh, it's a good sample, uh, the bronchial wash or aspiratorical aspirate or any of these. These, you don't, you don't need to put them in viral transport media because this will dilute the sample, the genetic material, the viral particles. So place it just in sterile plain tube and transport it to the uh, lab immediately. If there is a deal, it should be kept in the refrigerator for up to 72 hours. If more than 72 hours, if you are expecting a delay more than 72 hours, then freeze it and send it to the lab, freeze it or with uh, ice, with um, a dried ice. So this is the map of the, the genetic map of the virus. So uh, here we can see the whole genetic map of the virus. Many genes, many targets genes are used in the diagnosis, starting from open reading 3, 1A, and to the spike protein, which contains the, uh, to the, I mean, spike protein and envelope protein, M protein, and membrane protein, and nucleocapsid protein. So many, many companies use a combination uh, of, uh, some of these genes, usually better is two or more. So some of the companies use uh, uh, RNA dependent RNA polymerase gene with E envelope and nucleic acid. Some of them use S and E based on the company. Some of them are using N and, uh, and ORF and some of them are using uh, N and uh, ORF1B. And uh, I, I know that one kid use only, only one gene, but if there is, um, we believe that using one target is not enough, especially now with a lot of mutation in this virus. And some are using the three uh, engines, three, three subunits of the engine. So now we go to the brief for those. Uh, we go to the principle for those not familiar with the BCR. We give just a brief in, uh, brief just summary for the basic principles of the BCR. As first, we do the nucleic acid uh, extraction, genetic material extraction, and then we do a PCR, but this PCR is called RT-PCR uh, because it's reverse transcript. We reverse transcript RNA of the virus and convert it to DNA because the PCR cannot amplify RNA directly. It has to be converted to DNA to be, to be amplified. So then after it converts to DNA, that's why it's called R reverse transcriptase. Then they amplify it using specific primer, targeting one of uh, the region, target the conserved region of, of uh, some of the genes mentioned earlier. And uh, props, uh, or props also, a specific props. So to make the amplification visible by uh, emission of light. Then after the amplification, we check the results. The controls must be checked before we go to patient samples and before checking the patient samples. Results interpretation depends on the amplification care and cycling three short number. However, result interpretation must be must be done by specialized microbiologists or virologists with clear information on a clinical picture along with the history of contact, history of trouble. Um, the virus just must have a history of contact of that patient, history of trouble, history of vaccination, or, or and the previous acquisition of COVID-19 infection. So this is these are the some of the machines used for extraction. This is a uh, semi-automated, and some of them are fully automated. And this is fully automated uh, nuclear, uh, sorry, this is fully automated uh, BCR machines. This is called uh, point of care. However, it's not, it's, it's called point of care because the results can be within 45 minutes, 30 to 45 minutes. And because it's, um, uh, 
I mean, it's small. It's a small module. So it's small with uh, each single module can work as a separate. But however, again, although it's point of care, but it's better to be placed in the lab because you open, you have, to, there are safety measures have to be followed strictly as you are opening um, uh, a respiratory sample should be within a safety cabinet. Okay, to uh, validate the result, we have first to check the controls and minimum of three controls are used. Uh, it's internal control, uh, a minimum of three out of these. So internal control to rule any inhibitors inside each single sample. Extraction control is to check if the extraction is okay and no contamination in the extraction. And if there is, in case any contamination, okay, to know the where the stage where the contamination happened, if it is from the extraction or after extraction. So usually this is a negative control. Internal control is a positive control and positive control to validate the whole assay, negative control to validate the whole assay. So result validation and interpretation. Each control must give the expected result. Positive should be risk positive, negative should be negative, and so on. And then we check after we validate the control uh, the results, the control results, then we check the target and target detected um, when there is a proper, okay, proper sigmoid shape and a reasonable threshold value. This is um, how the sigmoid, uh, this is how the curve should be. It's uh, should be proper sigmoid, although it's if, even if there is a little bit difference, but it has to be at least sigmoid or close to sigmoid shape. And a proper, a reasonable uh, crossing threshold. What do we mean? What do we mean by crossing threshold? Is the number of cycles, the number of cycles required for the signal to cross the uh, background level, the noise, the background. It's usually inversely propor proportional to the viral load in the sample. So if the viral load is very high, then the threshold will be very low. If the viral load is very low, the threshold, the crossing threshold will be very high. However, this also depends. We cannot give a definitive uh, cycling threshold because each kit has a different one. Each kit is putting that the cross, the cycling threshold, it should be less than, let's say, 40 less than 37. However, most of the positive cases will be less than 37, the crossing threshold. And uh, again, also to validate the result, two targets have to be positive to compare positive results. If no target is detected, then it's it's coronavirus not detected, uh, the genetic material not detected. If two targets, uh, if no target detected, then it's negative. If two targets detected, this confirmed the case. However, it's all, if only one target detected, if you are using a kit with two targets, which is most recommended, and most of the kits, and you just get one target, then this is inconclusive or indeterminate results. Usually inconclusive or indeterminate, uh, indeterminate results, usually due to low, could be due to low viral load, okay, and a proper sample collection and mutation of the target genes. And also it could be the sample time collection. And not only in a proper sample, it's the time of sample collection. Maybe it's very, very early or it's very late. Okay, however, how to avoid this, to avoid these, or to go, to try to get a conclusive result, we collect, we ask for another sample, collect another sample at different time, okay, and or using alternative targets. So another kit with different uh, different targets to rule out any mutation. Okay, it's although it's uh, the gold standard, although it's the Molecular testing is the gold standard, and now all labs depends on the molecular test for the diagnosis of COVID-19. However, there are some challenges in molecular tests. Uh, many factors can interfere with the result, whether related to the virus itself or to the method itself, like the collection procedure and the handling of the materials, or even to the viral load of the sample, a type of the material collected, duration of symptoms, and disease severity. And like one of these challenges is mutation, okay, mutation uh, of the virus, uh, mutation of the target genes can uh, give false negative results. Not only mutations mismatch between the primer, but sometimes there are there is no mutation 
helper because we are using primer, conserve primer and conserve props. Sometimes in, in factory, in designing these primers and, and props, any mismatch between them might cause false negative results. Uh, as I mentioned, a collection, procedure, and handling of the material type of the swab used, as mentioned, should be Dacron swab. No, not cotton, no wooden shaft, very early or very late material uh, collection. Collection technique and the type of the material, collection technique used, and the type of the material, I mean the type of the specimen used, and errors in sample handling during or after swap collection, leading to, um, uh, leading to uh, contamination. And the <coughs> most of the PCR sensitivity are around, uh, it doesn't exceed 95, some of them 70 to 95. So this might, we might miss some results. A positive nucleic acid test in respiratory tract secretion has no direct relationship with the virus viability or infectivity, since inactive or dead virus particles can be also identified. And that's why we see some people positive for PCR even months, up to three months. So it doesn't have a relationship with the virus viability. Uh, uh, because now it's um, because of the demands of PCR testing for molecular tests and to decrease the burden on Ministry of Health labs now, from March 2020, Saudi CDC has opened the door for other laboratories to test for coronavirus by BCR, molecular method, as far as they met the Saudi national lab requirements for SARS coronavirus 2 testing, especially now it's required for trouble, some of them for, for even for trouble and um, for, uh, for many things. Uh, SARS coronavirus testing is not allowed in any governmental or private laboratories unless they obtain the accreditation certificate from the national laboratory at the center for disease prevention and control uh, in Saudi Arabia, which is Wiqaya. And these are the checklists. Uh, as I'm a member in inspection of this lab, I think uh, this, this is the latest checklist, but it's going to be updated within a few, maybe uh, within weeks or a week. Yeah, but this, the most important is to have, because safety is the first, um, the first, the most important thing is negative pressure class, uh, certified class to biological safety cabinet and positive and negative pressure room. And there must be um, at least one consultant microbiologist with experience in molecular biology. Uh, technologists can sometimes verify the results, but when, when we say that it must be a consultant microbiologist or virologist because uh, the one who verified the result must correlate the result with the history as we mentioned, history of contact, history of trouble, of a trouble, history of uh, vaccination, history of um, uh, pre -inf uh, of uh, another of, um, infection. So that's why a full picture, the microbiologist or virologist have to have the full picture before releasing the results. And to conclude, the COVID-19 pandemic demonstrated essential rule for uh, of molecular diagnosis in the control of communicable diseases Molecular assays, RT-PCR, reverse transcriptase PCR for detecting of coronavirus. Genetic materials in different respiratory specimens are the current gold standard for the diagnosis. Many factors, many factors related to the in, to individuals, the collection procedure, as mentioned, the test technique interfere with the, uh, with the sensitivity uh, of the test. Therefore, negative tests in patients with characteristic clinical picture should not discard the possibility of the co coronavirus. If the patient still has symptoms, he has, to be, he has to be retested again. And for antibody tests, uh, for antibody tests, many factors influence on their sensitivity and specificities, such as symptoms, severity, the presence of cellular immune response, rolling virus credence from the body, and um, Supportive tests and salary laboratory tests show, altera show alteration that are characteristic of COVID-19, but they lack specificity. And the diagnosis of COVID-19 should be based on a clinical epidemiological history and tests for etiological diagnosis and tests to support the diagnosis of infection and or its complications. Thank you so much.
Thank you very much, Dr. Asana. It's for it was a very nice uh, and interesting lectures, and it's I think it's uh, answered a lot of it. Uh, let's start. Uh, I have here many questions, mainly about ask about the vaccine. Uh, for Dr. Maram, um, most of the audience ask about the mix uh, vaccine or uh, are safe for uh, to have it or no. Uh, yes, they are safe, but uh, it's better to complete your vaccine with the same vaccine you've received. Um, more more reactions or uh, side effects uh, occur with uh, mixing the vaccines. Um, so with the fever and the myalgias and stuff with mixing the uh, vaccines. But they are safe to mix, especially when the patient usually has a, a reaction or something to the one of them, we can give the other. It's safe, but better to stick to the one you received before. Okay. Um, for uh, Dr. Ammar, they ask about uh, uh, if uh, if uh, if any chance to get another uh, series of uh, COVID with the other uh, variant uh, um, COVID. Dr. Ammar, Come. they asking uh, if they uh, if any person had this. Uh, yes. uh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, this is uh, regarding the recurrence or reinfection with COVID virus. Uh, when waning of the antibodies from uh, previous infection, uh, this is due to natural immunity or even due to waning of antibodies produced by uh, vaccine. Uh, some patient, may, some studies may say three months, maybe six months, then could be infected uh, or reinfected again. Another issue regarding the variants, uh, the one may be infected by original virus, COVID virus. Uh, next time could be uh, infected by different, for example, Delta, Alpha, Beta, Gamma, or whatever other uh, variant. Uh, something also very important, some patients may, may get positive PCR test during the first 12 uh, weeks, first three months. Uh, and this may be not positive patient, but only due to remaining residuals of uh, virus some particles of virus that may lead to positive PCR. Uh, but uh, reinfection could happen from the same original virus or from different Delta viruses when the immunity dropped down or antibodies, yes. Okay, that's one question also for Dr. Maram. Uh, they said, is the side effect of vaccine law in second dose? Uh, as I mentioned, no, the, do the second dose usually has uh, the symptoms after it. For mRNA vaccines, they had the myalgia, fever, uh, joint pain after second vaccine, more commonly. Okay, uh, also, that's the last question. They said, uh, are the uh, is the vaccine safe for lactating women? Pregnancy and in lactation, it's safe. They found this, uh, they did a study about uh, pregnant milk uh, contents of the vaccine in milk and it wasn't uh, present. So it's safe for lactating females and pregnant females. I see. That's another question about the vaccine. I think many people are interested in the vaccine. That's one question said uh, the first vaccine uh, shot was taken six months ago. Is it okay to take second shot now? Dr. Maran? Yes, the vaccine should be taken. They recommend not to repeat it, uh, even though the vaccine was uh, taken uh, a while back. Are you saying that he took both vaccines and now taking it the third? She said the first vaccine shot was taken six months ago, but now okay. she wants to do it again. Is that safe for her? or? Uh... It's it's safe, but um, uh, yeah, the, the the effect of the of the vaccine, uh, I don't know, but it is safe, and the CDC doesn't recommend uh, to take uh, any another third vaccine with this situation. But uh, the the level of efficacy of the vaccine, I'm not quite sure about that one. Okay, this is also again uh, for uh, vaccine. This ask how long the vaccine is lasting. It depends, I think, and what do you think, Dr. Maram? Uh, well, it's the different from vaccine, vaccine. Study, a, re a recent study showed that a breakthrough vaccines occurred in patients that were the first to, uh, to take the vaccine. So uh, from the, the vaccinated population that had breakthrough infections, the, uh, the population were from the people that were vaccinated uh, from the first groups. 
So um, we're not quite sure how long the immunity lasts, but uh, it, uh, it does show with the evidence that it does wean. Okay, that's what most of the questions have. Thank you very much for a very informative uh, presentation. We are all enjoy really, and it was very nice, clear. Thank you for everybody uh, to get the time to attend this uh, webinar. Thank you very much for having us. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very Thank much. You very Thank much. you. Thank you. And have Thank a nice night. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you. Good.